Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Peoples, uh, Chair of Director of East Asian Studies, Chair of Sociology Anthropology, and uh, I'm also a co-director along with Nick Crane and John Krieger of this year's Sagan National Colloquium. So they gave me the honor, privilege, and glory of introducing our speaker tonight, Josh Lepowski. And Josh is from the um, Department of Geography in the Memorial University of Newfoundland, uh, born in Vancouver, BC. Uh, but he travels south to the U.S. to enroll in the Geography Department and Ph.D. program at the University of Kentucky, which is recognized, as some of you know, as one of the very top geography uh, departments. Um, then he received his Ph.D., and 10 years ago he moved north for some reason, um, and then east to St. John's, Newfoundland, which is where... Uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland is. He's now an associate professor, but I'm sure that status won't last for very long. Right, Josh? <laughs> His major research interest uh, and work has been in electronic waste, also known as e-waste. And electronic waste is more than a simple byproduct, that's in quotes in my notes here, of human consumption and use. And it's not even a very simple concept, and I think he's going to talk a bit about that this evening. Uh, Professor Lepowski has worked most extensively in Malaysia, but also has conducted waste on e uh, and conducted research on e-waste in Bangladesh uh, and Mexico. So he's pretty well traveled, both in terms of his travels and in terms of his research. Uh, he's an editor and contributor to Discard Studies, Social Studies of Waste, Pollution, and Externalities. And as some of you know, um, this uh, website has become a major online source of information and ideas about discards. By the way, it was founded by um, uh, one of our previous Sagan National Colloquium speakers this year, Robin Nagel. Remember her? And is maintained by another one of our speakers this year, this year uh, Max LeBiron. So, you know, we have a little foot in the door there. Uh, well, we don't, but they do. So, uh, Josh's title tonight is Electronic Waste or How to Love a Mind Bomb, which sounds like it could be interesting. So, welcome, please welcome uh, Josh Lepowski from Memorial University of Newfoundland. Well, uh, my thanks to Jim for that uh, introduction and uh, to all of you for being here. It's a real pleasure to have been invited and um, fingers crossed we will um, not encounter any uh, technical difficulties as I uh, give this presentation tonight. Um, I'll explain what the term mind bomb means in a few minutes if you've never heard it before. Um, but uh, let me start uh, by sort of giving you uh, a, a quick preview of what I will make a claim about, and that, that is that um, the predominant way of talking about electronic waste and solving it as a problem um, typically focuses on uh, re recycling. And the reason that I think that that is important is that that approach as a solution will never lead to a solution to electronic waste, even on its own terms. Now that's a bald statement to start off with, so um, let me shift now to uh, offering you a, an analytical story um, about the kind of research that I've been doing for the last few years, and what I will present is uh, very much a global uh, synopsis of electronic waste flows, um, but one that also, uh, I hope, uh, usefully complicates it uh, for you. Um, so to tell that story, Oh, okay, uh, to tell that story, I need to start by talking about algorithms. Um, algorithms are um, those rules for solving uh, problems that whisper in the background of our, well, many aspects of our digital lives, but in part our, um, our searches. And I'm gonna, in the next uh, few slides, talk to you of, uh, about some uh, findings from um, by turning search patterns into research patterns and how that plays out in relation to electronic waste. But what you need to know about algorithms is that search engines like Google protect those the specificities of their algorithms quite closely. That's no surprise. <clears throat> but one way or another, these search algorithms are a combination of what is referred to as in-link count how many other websites link into a given site, the user popularity, how much it circulates, that sort of thing, the freshness or how old or new is the site, and how long has it been there, its longevity. And some combination of, of that uh, 
equals the relevance of a given search result that you receive. Now, when we're searching in our typical Google searches, um, these are those searches become highly curated for us based on our uh, previous search behavior, depending on your settings of your browser. Um, so in the next slide, what I want to uh, show you are some results of searching for images of place, just place. And the place that I thought I would start with is here. When you use some methodological techniques, the details of which I will bracket, but I'm very happy to talk about at, after the talk is over if you're interested, you can extract yourself as a researcher a little bit from uh, the, the Google search algorithm and get results that are not so highly curated for your personal search terms. There's some ways to do that. When I type into some open source software that I use, this, the simple uh, search term uh, Delaware, Ohio. These were the first 20 images that came up. I really have no idea what they're showing or what they mean, <clears throat> but I can take these, the, each of the links that those images appear at and drop those links into a second piece of open source so software, which will mine all of the text that, those, uh, that is at those links and return something like this, which are just word counts that are appearing on those links associated with those images. <clears throat> I'll leave it to you to determine what average is doing there as one of the top <laughs> results. <clears throat> but my point is, is that I, I got these results simply by searching the place through the term Delaware, Ohio. That's all I put in as the search term. Now, some of you, no doubt have been studying electronic waste and some of the places that are, uh, have come to be associated with that. And so the next couple of slides looks at the results that you get when you search just the place name of some of those uh, sites associated with electronic waste. So the first one is Gui China. Okay, has anyone come across that term or heard of it in association with electronic waste? If you have, great. If not, it doesn't matter. But keep in mind, all I searched was the place name Guiyu. Oh, sorry, mm. I got ahead of myself. What I, didn't <laughs> what I didn't find, what I didn't find when I searched Delaware, Ohio, was any images of waste, right? This is your municipal landfill. I had to actively search that image out, right? None of that came back by accident. Now, Guiyu. <laughs> now, all I did was search Guiyu. I didn't say Guiyu and e-waste or electronic waste, just the place name. Notice what comes back, right? There's not even a map, right? The only way that our online behavior knows Guiyu in English is as an e-waste site, yeah? These are the terms that when you drop the URLs that each of those images came from, text mine all of the, the text that is there and dump it into some other software, this is what appears, right? Obviously, this place and waste go together, an electronic waste. Notice the prominence, too, of recycling, right? Here on the left-hand side of the screen, one of the top returned words in all of those sites that came up through that search. So let's move, to, uh, do the, the same thing with another site that's commonly referred to in the e-waste uh, debates, and that's uh, Agwabloshi in Ghana. Same process, just plug in the place name Agwabloshi. Here are your image results, right? Agwabloshi, for those of you who don't know, is a small section of uh, the capital city of Ghana uh, in Accra. And at least in the Anglo internet world, this is what equals relevant search associated with that place name, right? No maps, nothing else besides these sorts of images of, of waste um, and, uh, and the people that deal with that. Again, note the terms that are mined from each of those websites, all relating to waste, the predominant um, way of dealing with that waste is recycling, and uh, we get you know a sense of the apocalyptic nature of, of the work there. Okay, <clears throat> so 
in a certain sense, the public conversation, at least as it occurs on the web, is associating certain places that deal with electronic waste in certain ways, in particular with recycling. If we turn to the academic literature, and here I'm showing you the search results that I, that I uh, got just a few days ago on Scopus, a major scholarly uh, article indexing database, you'll see that uh, there are, as of that date, a little over 1,700 articles with the words electronic waste or e-waste in their title, their abstract, or their keywords. Drop those titles, abstracts, and keywords into the same text mining software, and here's what you get. Again, look at the prominence of recycling. It is out of a, a, a corpus, a body of, of words of over 500,000 in that total uh, set of data. Recycling is the second most uh, frequently appearing term. So in other words, talking about electronic waste has been framed in a very particular way. When we look at that over time, here what I've done is taken the author generated the author keywords associated with all of those articles and plotted them over time as far back as, as the, the data would allow. And what we see over time, up to 2015, is that certain terms have, if you, if you will, floated to the top of the, the discourse, right? The, the, the foment of other key terms that are occurring down here. You can see certain terms have risen to being prominent terms of art, right? E-waste, electronic waste, and, and we, the uh, waste, electronic and electrical equipment. And the predominant way of dealing with all of that, recycling, right? So our conversations about this thing called e-waste have been framed over time in a very specific way, and I want to talk to some extent about why that's important. So mind bombs. <coughs> mind bombs are, uh, I suppose, a semi-technical term that um, refer to uh, media techniques that were adopted by environmental NGOs like Greenpeace in the 70s that, uh, it, that um, Kevin DeLuca in his uh, book uh, Image Politics uh, defines this way. So they are uh, geared towards flagging media attention, grabbing and grabbing they are intended uh, to, as he says here, um, work as mind bombs that, uh, that work to expand the universe of thinkable thoughts. Now keep that definition in mind when you think back to the academic discourse on electronic waste, which is so relevant right by the uh, website, by the more public internet conversation about those places, which is almost exclusively about the site. And so part of what I want to argue is certainly not an anti-environmental NGO message. That's not my point. But my point is, is that these framings of waste matter. Waste is a very mercurial thing. And what it is and what it means, the implications that it has for people and places, is very uh, slippery. Um, and yet, how we think about waste through the kinds of images I was showing you a few minutes ago has really narrowed the range of solutions that we're taking seriously. This is important, this narrow range of solutions. Some of you who, who were here for my friend and colleague Max Lugaron's talk a few weeks ago um, probably saw uh, an image like this where um, uh, looking at overall waste arising, there's supposed to be numbers there, so I'm not sure why those aren't showing up, but looking at overall waste arisings, uh, municipal solid waste or household waste, which is typically where we do our recycling, right, at the municipal solid waste stage of things, that amounts to roughly 3% of overall waste arisings. The vast majority somewhere on the order of 90 or more percent, depending on the place you're in. This part here is industrial waste. And household recycling, municipal solid waste recycling, will do nothing to touch that 90 to 97 percent of waste. And that's why it's very important, I think, to keep in mind this, this point of uh, this part of the screen that Matt is 
estimates that the way a problem is defined forecloses on the types of solutions that make sense in too many cases when there is no waste of labor issue. Solutions that focus on post-consumer um, waste are immediately proposed before the problem is being properly defined. And that, I think, uh, speaks to waste as a general category, there is such a thing, but it certainly speaks to um, e-waste and the predominant ways of um, talking about solutions to it. So let's look at that in some semi-hard numbers here. I apologize for the, the complexity of the, the visualization here, but I've done a little bit of um, data visualization, I guess, using data from Apple itself. And let me just say, I'm certainly not vilifying Apple, much as I am cursing my laptop at the moment. Um, you know, I use these products all the time, so I'm not excluding myself from, from this criticism. Uh, but Apple releases its uh, an environmental report for each of or most of the models uh, of equipment that it produces uh, almost yearly, and so these are Apple's own numbers. Um, I'm just showing out, uh, numbers for the iPhone, and these are uh, Apple's own measures. They they measure uh, greenhouse gas production uh, kilograms of, of CO2. Up here along the top, we've got uh, 2009 to 2016, hopefully for this presentation, Apple just released the newest iPhone a few weeks before I got here, so I could add 2016. Total greenhouse gas production has been going up, except for here there is this drop. Um, that, that drop is largely a result of the size of the new iPhone, it's, it's smaller than the model before it. So, um, but, so while, while total greenhouse gas production has been going up, that's only part of the story, because what you see down here is each model year, 2009, 10, 13, 14, 16, the orange bars are greenhouse contributions relating to production, okay? So, and the blue one, uh, the blue bars here are greenhouse uh, gas emissions related to customer use of phones. Now look, customer use has been getting much better from year to year, right? So your phones are getting more efficient when you use them. But over that same time period, every single model has gone up in terms of CO2 production in the production and manufacturing state. Now when you get rid of your iPhone and it goes into a recycling system, you're doing nothing touch those orange bars, right? Those have already happened. They happened before you bought the phone. Yeah? This is why thinking about solutions to a given problem need to be thought through quite carefully depending on the results that you want to achieve. Okay, so I'm going to switch tracks a little bit here and shift to uh, uh, a discussion of some important international regulation uh, related to electronic waste. That's the, it's called the, uh, the Basel Convention, the, the inter, uh, sorry, the, the Basel Con Convention on the Transboundary Shipment of Hazardous Waste, I'll just call it the convention. Um, and uh, over here you see a map uh, showing all the countries in blue who have signed and ratified the convention. So yes, that is the US in the red that has not ratified, as has not Afghanistan at this point, um, or Haiti, or Haiti. Um, now, people like to make that point a lot. The US has actually signed the Basel Convention. They have not ratified it. There is a, a difference, but um, I don't want to simply vilify the US. Now, the, the Basel Convention is a reasonably complex piece of international legislation. But the parts of it that are important can be boiled down to what I tried to show in this diagram. The Basel Convention imagines a world, our world, and that world is divided in two. Part of that world is what is called the N7 signatories. This refers to an N of the convention. Those, those N7 signatories are the European community, the EC, uh, Lincolnshire, and the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The 
non-acceptable is everybody else. In the negotiations of the Basel uh, Convention, historically, that division was very explicitly done in terms of these are the industrialized or developed countries, these are the developing or later was countries in transition, and now they have a technical designation as non-acceptable. That's important uh, for thinking about international flows of electronic waste because what the Basel Convention says, in essence, is that flows within each half of the world are okay, right? Annex 7 can trade amongst itself, non-Annex 7 can trade amongst itself, but no Annex 7 countries or developed countries can send to developing or non uh, countries. The convention says nothing about trade in the opposite direction, which is telling in its absence, right? It was never even conceived of as problematic. Okay. So, just keep in mind, Annex 7, uh, not Annex 7, what I'm showing here, which is really meant as just an indicator, are mobile phone uh, subscriptions per capita, this is all World Bank data from as far back as it goes uh, for their were cell phones um, to uh, 2015 is the latest data. All of the orange lines there are is the adoption of mobile phone subscriptions by people in non annex 7 states, the developing world has In blue, all of the annex 7 states, the so called industrial development, certain uh, development. Now, looking at that kind of tangled mass of lines, I suspect that you can start to already pick out some important patterns there. Um, if, you, if you look at that mass of blue lines, there is a kind of plateauing going on, especially here, right? Whereas for the orange lines, the trajectory is very much an upward one. To illustrate what I mean, I've pulled out in this slide some examples that I had hoped would match a little bit more closely to where you students are going to be going for uh, greater, greater research and not related to the e-waste brand, but I hit some of them. Anyway, the two blue lines. This is the United States mobile phones subscriptions per capita, and this second one is Canada. This is Singapore. So you've got, and I know the scale is too small, small to see, but uh, right around here is uh, uh, 100. So you actually have more cell phone subscriptions than there are people in Singapore. Malaysia, the Philippines, um, Indonesia, there's Ghana in West Africa, and here's Nigeria, okay, just a little bit below. Now, the problem of e-waste is about waste electronics moving from the so-called developed world to the developing world. We are, in, by many measures, already at a point where that comprises some of the smallest portions of the, of the issue. Most of the electronic waste is now being generated in the so-called developing world and moving either within that region or from the developing world uh, to the global north, back to high-tech refineries that are after the very precious metals that you can get out of uh, electronics. Oh, of course, this is going to be shown sideways. Wow. <clears throat> I, thousand curses on Apple. <laughs> um, I'll try to very quickly describe. This is actually a map that has been done until the United States. It's open this way. You can um, in blue here, there's Europe in the center. The, the real geographers among you in the audience know that there's no proper way to orient the map, and the North does not have to be on the top. So this is, this is for you. <laughs> uh, here's Europe, here's the US, uh, here's Southeast Asia. Uh, the, the countries here are the nodes, they're colored in, in uh, blue. Blue corresponds to uh, Annex 7. In fact, in 1996, before there was even a discussion about something called electronic waste, Indonesia, which you see here, was the major importer of 
some some data available for uh, tracking uh, old forms of electronic waste. <clears throat> that might seem to fit the kind of the, the, the dominant storyline about the waste being dumped from the global north to the global south, except that some of the most important flows, this one here is coming in from Hong Kong, this one here coming in from Singapore, were coming, even at that point, from non annexed countries. Countries that were under the Basel Convention, uh, part of it was perfectly legal for them to be doing it. Now, to say it's perfectly legal doesn't mean that it's necessarily good, but they weren't breaking any laws by doing it. <coughs> Okay, 2012, <clears throat> at least it's still oriented the same way. Europe's in the same place, the US and Canada are in the same place. Here's Indonesia now. When you tally up all of these crazy spaghetti lines of flows, Indonesia is now a net exporter of electronic waste. China um, is a, a, a net importer, also exporting to a whole range of countries in, throughout Asia as well as back to Europe. Canada as well, back to some of the very few um, industrial smelters that exist in the world that can actually handle um, electronic waste as part of their feedstock. There are about half a dozen of those on the planet. So if you don't get the stuff there, then you're not going to be able to smell things down uh, into uh, the kinds of um, precious metal materials that, that these companies are after. Okay, so we can gather up all of that information that was on those two uh, cartograms and look at the data um, in, a, in a different way. We're, we're looking at the same data across time here. The, the flow lines are proportional to the total volume of flow. This giant purple flow here is Annex 7 to Annex 7. So in other words, the developed world or industrialized countries trading amongst themselves. This line down here is e-waste moving from Annex 7 to non-Annex 7. So when we're talking about e-waste and it's framed with sites like Liu and Aboboshi as um, icons of what the problem is, we're actually talking about this much. <clears throat> okay, so that was a lot of um, sort of quantitative data. Let me take you, and a very global synopsis, let me take you to some of these sites where I've done some of my field work, and let me quickly mention that it would be impossible for me to do this field work without being able to work with some really great graduate students as well as some, some other faculty who I collaborate with. So this is not uh, just me. Um, but uh, here, here's an image from Agba Bloshi in Accra, in, in Ghana. And um, uh, what I wanted to highlight here is the acronym that has been um, uh, carved into uh, the top here. Uh, G-I-M-P-A property. GIMPA uh, stands for the Ghana Institute of Management and Planning um, Authority. And what I'm highlighting here is this is domestically from Ghana, right, generated electronic waste. Now this is a single photo not taken in any systematic way, right, so you can't generalize from this photo. But held in conjunction with some of this broader quantitative data, it at least points to uh, the idea that we need to take um, uh, domestic generation in so-called developing countries very seriously if we want to understand uh, electronic waste as a problem. And indeed there have been a number of studies in several West African countries, the most recent of which shows at least with flows from Europe that those European flows to West Africa account for at most 16 percent of overall e-waste arising. The rest of it is coming from people, businesses, institutions in West African countries discarding their electronics. And in a lot of ways that shouldn't surprise us, 
right? Our images of you know, the so-called developing world persist and stay with us, and yet these are rapidly globalized, sorry, well, they are rapidly globalizing, but certainly rapidly urbanizing places with large education sectors, large healthcare sectors, banking sectors, and all of that is dependent on information technology in many of the ways, uh, same ways that our own are, and so it really shouldn't be a surprise, and yet the way the e-waste debate has been framed, that is still surprising that role of domestic waste. This is also an Agma Blush sheet. Uh, part of the story that almost never gets to be. Uh, really, right in the center of Agma Blush, you can find shacks like this, where you find uh, young, typically young men who are scavenging equipment either from the scrap area itself or buying bits and pieces from uh, people who bring carts to the city and, and negotiate for, for, for recyclables, reusables. And they are going custom PCs from scavenger carts. They, if you go to them and say, I want a PC with such and such uh, characteristics, they will build it for you. How many in the room will be able to do that? Yeah, sort of maybe in the front. I will say for myself, I could. But this is part of my point, right, is to sort of de-familiarize and de-center how we might think about uh, what electronic waste means for the underlying condition. Uh, these, um, these two technicians, um, like many others, are often self-taught, or they, they are taught in a kind of apprentice-style relationship with a, someone who's already established a business. They go off and, and start their own. Uh, eventually. Okay, back to a little bit of quantitative data here. Pretty simple. I'm shifting now from West Africa over to Southeast Asia to highlight some, some work in Singapore. Back to thinking about the Basel Convention <clears throat> and, and a, you know, a pretty simple measure of wealth <coughs> GDP per capita. This lighter gray line here is the average GDP per capita for all Annex 7 countries lumped together. So the, the industrialized world, right? European community, OECD, and, Licht and Liechtenstein. And this darker line is Singapore's GDP per capita. Okay. Last, time, last time I looked at the data, um, Singapore, uh, Singapore GDP per capita actually exceeded both US and Canada, so richer in Singapore than here, but an unannex seven country, right? So you've got uh, a chunk of, of the world uh, that is uh, very wealthy in both, certainly in, in absolute terms, but, or I should say in absolute terms, but certainly in relative terms. If you think about where Singapore is geographically located, adjacent to Indonesia, or in Malaysia, uh, not far from Bangladesh, um, markets, potential markets for used, repaired, and refurbished secondhand equipment bought new in Singapore, right, by very wealthy, well, wealthy in relative and absolute terms Singaporeans. This is the Simlim Mall in downtown Singapore. Um, there are other places like this. I could have taken a similar photo in Singapore. But here you see uh, an electronics market. It's, it, it's several floors, at least, uh, at least five, if not six floors of new and used electronics. And adjacent in the neighborhoods around Simlin Mall, you'll find smaller businesses like this that are collecting discarded electronics from and not just collecting cast-offs, but actively buying, right, used electronics from Singaporeans. So ABC buy spoiled phones, spoiled phones. We will buy these, I see it in both English and uh, in, in uh, yeah, there's a little bit of Chinese there, not much. Um, we will uh, buy your, your used electronic devices. Why are they doing that? Because they can, uh, repair, refurbish, resell to use markets all throughout the region. Indonesia, Bangladesh, 
India, and so forth. Another advertisement in, uh, in uh, the neighborhood nearby Simlim, a bit hard to read, but this is advertising air cargo rates. And down here, is, so these rates are to India, these rates are to Bangladesh, and I'm looking for the words, but, uh, I, sorry, yeah, it's too hard to read, but this is specifically for electronics, right? Cost about uh, $7 a kilogram, so seven, uh, seven, oh, three and a half, three and a half bucks a pound, roughly, to sh send stuff by air to these secondhand markets in, in Bangladesh and, and India. After leaving places like Singapore, not only Singapore, but uh, uh, Singapore is certainly a key regional hub in, uh, in Southeast Asia and South Asia, they often come to places like this workshop in Dhaka, Bangladesh, where you have uh, whole streets devoted to um, you know, more or less formal and informal repair, refurbishment, and resale uh, shops. Highly skilled technicians, often with little or no formal training, right? They've learned through a, a, an apprentice style relationship and then subsequently open their own businesses. And highly specialized, not just, you know, we do electronics repair, but we repair HP printers, right? I mean, it's, it's a hyper specialized uh, business ecology. Uh, here, uh, a shop doing uh, monitor repairs. And, you know, not, I don't want to romanticize the picture at all. Um, not everything is repaired or can be repaired. Some of it is uh, processed in a variety of ways for uh, components and for material. One way to get materials embedded in a printer is to lift it over your head and smash it on the ground. Right? And then you have plastics, metals. Now, that can be occupationally hazardous in a variety of ways, but it isn't inherently toxic. The toxicity of the practice really depends on the product involved and, and the different um, handling, handling practices. Certainly, there are risks of things flying back into your face, you know, getting in your eyes, that kind of stuff. But, uh, so, in no way am I trying to prevent that. So, after this printer hits the ground, the same person we see here on his cell phone already calling the next business. Okay, we've got X amount of plastic, X amount of aluminum. What do you, you know, what, what can you give this for? The next business is about 50 meters down the street. And this is one of the challenges of following electronic waste is that electronics are multi-material, multi right? Plastics, metals, glass. So we can't, as soon as they start coming apart, you've got to have, <laughs> multiple people to follow multiple streams. So I'm just going to focus on the plastics. Um, oh, sorry, here's one example of the kind of material they're after. This is very high-grade copper in the wiring of electronics. Uh, many, many, many times higher grade than you would find in, a, you know, in ore from a mine, uh, which is why this is so highly coveted. This is incredibly high-grade aluminum. That's a heat sink uh, from a, a, a desktop. Uh, the, the grade of aluminum is many times greater than you could get out of, um, you know, uh, mining bauxite and refining it. Uh, so just following the plastics, so that deal you saw being made on the phone, <coughs> plastics are, are bailed, brought down the street to a separate micromanufacturing business. Um, here you see this is a, a, a plastic chipper, so the plastic is fed in kind of behind where this uh, gentleman is standing and comes out in the bin here as plastic chips. Here you see the, the chips here, uh, which are sorted and washed by color, um, sometimes through very problematic practices in terms of occupational health and safety, sorted by type, usually by smell, uh, and you do that by burning it, right? Inhale it, different plastics have a different odor terrible for you. I mean, it's, it's really awful. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, a skill, right? How many of us in the room would be able to differentiate the hundreds of grades of different plastic just by its odor, right? Uh, 
if you do, wow. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> um, okay, uh, those plastic chips brought over to a, a now another separate business, put into a hot plastic press that you see in the background here, and this, uh, this gentleman here churning out uh, CD and DVD cases, right? CD and DVD cases are sold back onto the local market in Dhaka, but also in Indonesia, uh, sorry, internationally, in uh, Singapore, China, India. So what are you looking at? Are you looking at an international globalized business? Yes. Right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, so that, I, I, I've given you a, a bit of a synopsis of repair, reuse, refurbishment, uh, the important role of that today. So I want to shift back now to this course around recycling and a really prominent role that it plays in uh, most discussions of electronic waste. Uh, now, I know there's a lot of numbers in, on that table there, and I'm drawing heavily on other people's work. This is uh, from uh, uh, an engineer. Williams has done some really great work looking at um, the uh, energy and material requirements of manufacturing and using electrons. Um, due to the software glitch, a little bit of text here has been shoved off the side. But what it says is that when you look at the, if you just focus on these numbers here, these are many joules of energy, notice that you've got. Um, the total many joules here, here are many joules used in manufacturing, here are many joules used during a, a, a use phase of the computer, which assumes three years of use. The point being is that the vast majority of energy was used up in manufacturing before you even bought the computer. So recycling uh, at the end of that three year life, that's what's relevant to you, will do nothing to change that. In fact, recycling is going to add a little bit right, to that energy footprint. And energy has to be produced somehow, right? Whether through uh, renewables or fossil fuels. And all of those have their own discards, their own waste, right? So switching now from a desktop example to a mobile phone example, this is a different paper uh, Eric Williams was involved with, but a, a, another colleague of his, looking at uh, the title of the paper is Analysis of Material and Energy Consumption of Mobile Phones in China. <clears throat> so here you've got megajoules along the side. This is what I want to draw your attention to, right? Component manufacturing. Finish using your cell phone, recycle it, you will have done nothing to alter this. That's already happened right before you bought your cell phone. Usage, like we saw in that data from Apple, has been going down. Usage is getting more efficient. But those of you familiar with some ecological economics and uh, the Jevons paradox, which I can talk more about <laughs> if anyone has questions, might already know that as in efficiency increases, there can be a tendency for aggregate use to go up, right? Because increases in efficiency typically result in decreased prices, more people can buy it, more people use it, right? Okay, uh, same paper, data from the same paper, they point out that recycling can have these sorts of energy savings uh, for these materials. Um, energy savings relative to what they refer to as virgin material, that is mining resources out of the ground. So recycling in this respect is very impressive, right? 95% energy saving recycling versus pulling that aluminum out of the ground, refining it and processing it. Um, and, and similarly, very, very high um, uh, energy savings relative to uh, material extraction. So you're saving the work in places like this. This is the Bisbee copper mine just outside of Bisbee, Arizona. Very conveniently located right next to the highway on route to one of the field sites they worked in. Very <clears throat> uh, hard to get a scale that you can sort of see buildings here on the other side. Gives you a sense of the side of the head. Um, 
you take the little um, scenic lookout, as the highway refers to it, and there's a plaque there, uh, not showing the whole timeline that describes the life of that mine, but here you see 1975, personal computers, demand rises, right? So this ethereal realm of the virtual, the online, the electronic, is you know, deeply rooted in all of these primary industrial processes that leave very large footprints on the landscape. This is the Copper Queen mine shown through satellite images from Google uh, Maps. This is the mine. There's the, the sort of liquid body you were looking at. There are the buildings you saw a moment ago. All of this material that you see here out to and actually off in that direction, and all of the material seed this direction, is what is overburden, or what the mining industry calls overburden. Waste rock that has been moved out of the mine and placed on the landscape. Notice that the size of the mine, just the pit itself, is bigger than the town it built, right? <laughs> okay, now, so that time, so that aspect stuff down, uh, from from the papers I was referring to a moment ago uh, to that actual place, because we remember those energy savings from raw material extraction, right? Back to that measure of major individual energy use for mobile phone, right? You are getting those energy savings here, right? One of the smallest portions of the mobile phone's energy footprint. So the, set, the energy savings are huge in, in sort of percentage terms, but they, where they affect the process is crucial to understand if we're looking for solutions. Okay, so recycling. I think, you know, recycling has um, a, a, an element of magic in it for a lot of us, right? We put it in a blue bin and we, you know, send it, give it to a, a, a a business and it disappears, it goes away, magic happens, and it's good. Now, I don't want to suggest it's inherently bad either, but recycling is an industrial process, right? And industrial processes require material and energy throughputs. You can't get past that. This is uh, an electronics recycling facility in southern Ontario in, in Canada. Here you, you see they're, they're on the copper line here. This is what typical industrial scale electronics recycling looks like. These are uh, pre-processed mishmash of electronics being uh, moved up a conveyor belt here into this giant steel drum, which you see more closely here, which is really just a canister full of a whole bunch of really heavy chains whipping around at a ridiculous speed to smash that stuff into smaller and smaller pieces. That's high-tech recycling. And at the um, conclusion of that process, we'll get stuff like this. This is a commodity rate copper at that facility. What that means is copper is ready to be sold back onto the world market, into whatever, other electronics, manufacturing, anything that requires <clears throat> This particular shipment that was in this box was going to um, a company that recycling for me. Would tell me who specifically? The, an American uh, manufacturing, uh, manufacturing company, so manufacturing copper pipes, who the recycling company claimed uh, was under contract with the Department of Defense to, uh, within 24 hours of the declaration of war, under contract to switch from manufacturing copper pipes to manufacturing. Uh, this was a uh, photo circa uh, 2010. So some of that copper that was formerly electronics is probably, or was probably, whipping around some war zone at some point in its next phase of life. So uh, something I've talked about is a little bit of the batteries and edges that they're yeah, I, I can talk more about that. There's more stories. <laughs> um, 
back to emphasizing this point about recycling. So here's a, a study, again, not my own work, looking at energy requirements for recycling mobile phone scrap. Um, and ener the, so energy inputs required, uh, material outputs, so you've got dust, metals, note dioxins, other organic ca uh, carbon, nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide. Uh, for a sense of the amount of energy, I have no idea what, what megajoules are, but that, you know, I have to conceptualize that as 38 kilowatt hours. We're turning on a little more than six 60 watt bulbs and leaving them on for 100 hours. That would be what you need to shred uh, 1,000 kilograms of, of mobile phones. That energy had to have been produced somewhere under some conditions. And where that refining and smelting is done, as I was saying earlier, is in a very small number of smelters dispersed globally. So three of those smelters happen to be in Canada. This is the Belgian smelter, uh, the uh, Horn smelter in Royal Miranda, Quebec. This is the Trail smelter in British Columbia. Uh, this is uh, Sims Recycling, the major electronic recycler, and HP in California. Partnered up in the late 90s to start the electronic recycling uh, program. And um, uh, in, in, in the year 2000, a business journalist did a little story on something called electronic waste. And this was one of the first times you see the phrase electronic waste used. And the problem is that right now is that most of this is going to landfill. That circle that you see around there. Is a 500 kilometer radius, which in a study done years later by some research team in, in Europe, uh, they did a study of sort of a life cycle oriented study of electronics recycling under new e waste legislation in Europe. And their findings said that after 500 kilometers of road transport, the environmental negatives of recycling electronics outweigh the positives. So, at the time that HP and SINs were engaged in that partnership, the components uh, that related to capital ray tubes, the old big monitors, the CRT monitors, uh, and plastic, were being trucked from California to Miranda and to Valladolid. The plastics were burned for fuel in the smelters, and uh, the, the uh, CRT monitors were processed for lead and copper. All three, well, those, those two sites that they're industrially used for back decades, but uh, as we we'll see here. Yeah. Um, these, this is emissions data for just two emissions measurements lead, PV, tons per year. Notice the scale is logarithmic. And cadmium, the heavy metal, tons per year. Um, the Trail, Horn, and Brunswick smelters here. Um, now, in both cases, the overall trend is down. In other words, fewer and fewer emissions. Right? So, good. Um, but notice that we're still talking about, even in best case scenarios in the year, now this is old data for sure, but it's the year uh, in which uh, the HP program was running. So it's at least some, uh, bit of that, that HP material was getting into those smelters, you are still talking about, you know, a minimum of tens of tons of lead being emitted from the smelter, right, onto the landscape, into the air. Cadmium, um, uh, you know, single, single digits, but, you know, a ton of cadmium is a lot. <laughs> in terms of its toxicological consequences. Getting into the soil, and particularly in, in trail in BC, um, a, a number of subsequent studies showing that children who live there um, ha are, are at very high risk of lead poisoning. So, to emphasize that point, here we see the kind of classic image associated, the mind bomb associated with the e-waste problem, right? Now, people in the developing world dealing with our waste. What we really almost never see are these images, but these images are not ones I took. These come from a government report from the government of British Columbia, Canada, 
around the trail structure. It talks about uh, lead uh, toxicity risk for children. You see the kinds of remediation work that has to go on. They're, they're, what they're doing is that they're digging up the topsoil of the residential homes and replacing it with new soil. And it's a bit hard to read here, but what the text says is children were encouraged to wash their hands after cleaning outside. Right? Almost never do we see that side of things like that. And I am not trying to argue that that side is somehow inherently more important, but it is almost absent from any discussion of electronic waste. And this is what happens when electronics waste is dealt with, I will use the quotes, properly, right? Through the proper recycling channels, through the industrially, uh, industrial smelting process. This, is, this result is what is supposed to happen, right? Okay, last few slides. I know we started late and I've kept you longer than you probably planned. So what to do, right? <laughs> what to do? The data on the left-hand side, again, I am not trying to notify Apple in any, in any way. There are one of the few companies that make data available. And they should be applied for that in, in all of uh, The data here shows uh, profit distributions for here the iPhone 2010 and here for iPad. It's these two giant red chunks. Right? Apple, Apple profits for the iPad at here are 30%. Apple profits for the iPhone are almost uh, 60%. Uh, that's bad. Labor as a cost, 1.8% labor in China, 1.8% for the iPhone, around 2% for the iPad. Now, if you're concerned about labor and labor conditions, that's an important story to tell. But if you are also concerned about the, for lack of a term, the environmental footprint of electronics and what happens after them, that profit margin is also important to talk about in relation to something called uh, extended use responsibility. Okay. I won't get into too much detail here, but the basic idea behind extended use responsibility is that in its genuine form or its idealized form, brand manufacturers would feel a price signal to their, their waste externalities and absorb those costs. And because they have to absorb those costs, as the story goes, they would innovate and find ways to reduce those costs as much as possible to maintain their, their profit margin. All of the legislation that has been passed in the US and Canada since uh, 20, uh, sorry, um, beginning about 2002 has um, uh, either implicitly or explicitly talked about doing so in terms of extended producer responsibility. None of it actually achieves it because in every case when you follow the money, you and I as consumers pay that price up front. We see it, depending on the jurisdiction you're in, it comes on your bill as either, it's either invisible or if it is visible, it comes as something called an environmental handling fee or an advanced disposal fee. Now that in and of itself isn't inherently bad. I think you can make an argument that those who consume a particular class of objects, right, might bear some responsibility for what, uh, for, for paying for the cost of dealing with them after they're done with it. I, you know, I think that's a plausible argument. But at the same time, that system of payment guarantees that OEMs, original equipment manufacturers like Apple, feel exactly zero price signal when it comes to dealing with uh, post-consumer electronics. So we talk about extended producer responsibility, we enact laws that explicitly invoke it, but when you, when you track how those laws then finance the system, none of it touches uh, original equipment manufacturers. So that, so sorry, so instituting genuine extended uh, producer responsibility, it would be one possible solution. Um, finding ways to scale the repair is a very important part of uh, that solution or solutions. The longer that we can keep things going, 
the more we are conserving all of our embodied energy and material, right, that is going into the, in the manufacturing process before we even bought them. Some of you may know there, there is a fairly robust electronics repair um, movement and business, uh, particularly in the US. These are some screenshots from uh, a business called iFixit, which has also been um, really important in um, uh, creating something called the Repair Association, which is, it's, I know it's too small to read here, but they are very active in pushing legislation in several states, um, Massachusetts, Cameron, New, uh, New Jersey, Nebraska, Minnesota, um, that they call fair repair. And it's very interesting in terms of how they're getting it to scale there. They're starting in the agricultural sector where farmers are finding that uh, big equipment manufacturers like John Beer, et cetera, were making arguments under the last round of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that tractors, combines, and whatnot should be covered under those copyright laws because of the software that's being built into different engine parts, made them into an IP, intellectual property, that it, was, it should be illegal, illegal, for farmers to repair their own. Uh, happened also in the automobile industry. Um, a lot of that uh, uh, negotiation around the, uh, the DCMA, the Digital Millennium uh, Copyright Act, was some of it was changed thanks to the work that I think the Repair Association did do. That scales, right? That shifts from, you know, sort of DIY repair or you know grassroots repair, all of which is fine. But if you want to scale that, right, you need to get beyond those individual kinds of um, responses. That's an example of that happening, I think. Finally, um, thinking about economic uh, action in, a, in its many diverse forms, um, I'm, I'm highlighting some, some key thinkers for me here, um, J.K. Gibson Graham and, and others, who um, among their many important lessons point out that if it exists, it is possible, right? If it exists, it is possible. We, take, we have taken for granted in two massive industries, automobile and pharmaceuticals, that we will have certain um, relationships with the products associated with those two industries. In, in the automobile sector, until very recently, it was assumed that you would be able to, if you wanted to, repair your own. Increasingly, that is under attack by red manufacturers who are looking to things like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to, to clamp down on that. But since there were cars, that has just been, that is how it is, right? We shall prepare our own automobiles. Now, we can have that in one multi billion dollar industry, right? If it exists, it is possible. Why can't we have it in another multi billion dollar uh, industry? Electronics. Would it affect this part of the pie? Maybe. But there is quite a big piece of the pie to affect and still come away, right, with a very substantial pie. That's automobiles. Oh, sorry, automobiles. Um, the other, well, actually, I should say the other two sectors, pharmaceuticals and food. We have in the US, the USMBA, right? All the criticisms that might be pointed to in the FDA are, you know, we can acknowledge those, but at the very least, we have already now a taking for granted system where we presuppose in advance that what is normal is the pharmaceuticals that we ingest, the food that we ingest, will be shown to have been safe before they are even manufactured, right? Before they are released onto the market. Yes, companies find ways around it. Yes, there are, uh, of course, instances where food products or Absolutely. But we have the framework where the basic premise is before you manufacture X, X will be shown to be um, uh, safe within you know, these tolerable limits. If we can do that in those two multi billion dollar industries, why can't we do it in another one like electronics? Again, 
If it exists, it is possible. Okay. <laughs> Last point I'll, I'll leave you with here. <clears throat> if I've left you with an anti-recycling message, if I've left you with an anti-environmental NGO message, then I've totally failed. That is not my point. Recycling is important, though not for the reasons that you might think. The messages that environmental groups have put out there, the mind bombs that they've given us, right, are, have been crucial for getting uh, a, a set of discussions going on, on issues like electronic waste. But what I'd like to suggest is that we need to, as it were, love our monsters, to quote someone that informs my work, Bruno Latour. These technologies are monstrous in many ways, right? But we shouldn't repeat the mistake that Dr. Frankenstein made in the famous novel, right? His mistake was to abandon the, cre the creature, right? To leave the monster behind. And that's what leads to the monster destroying everything that Dr. Frankenstein loves. We need to be asking about questions of love and care for our technologies. Questions that we ask, certainly while they're in the world, but of course before they're in the world, and questions like, how are we going to care for this set of technologies? Should we keep them going? If so, how? And if we are going to keep them going, who and what do we need to take into account, right, in order to care for our technologies? And I would argue that no one really has a single answer for that. So perhaps that's a place to then open things up for ideas and discussion here in the room. Thanks very much. Great, and I'll go ahead and carry this microphone around if anyone wants to begin the questions. How, how long uh, did you uh, do all this research? What was the span of time that you have been focusing on this problem specifically? Sure. Um, I started thinking about it around, uh, well, actually, while I was still doing my PhD research in um, uh, the, the early 2000s, I started, so I had had this great opportunity to work as a research assistant um, during my um, PhD, um, where I assisted with the research in, in Southeast Asia, looking um, at some industrial scale electronics manufacturing. It was my first real introduction to uh, you know, what industrial manufacturing, what the scale looked like. And from there, <clears throat> I've been interested in a long time in the material implications of digital technologies. Um, so I was already thinking along those lines. And so, so getting to see where things were produced, this was uh, around about 2000, getting to see the conditions under which, peop uh, under which products were being manufactured, it was not a huge conceptual leap to think about, well, okay, so here's where they get made. They then come into my hands and I use them, then what? And so while I was doing my PhD research on only in retrospect related ideas, <laughs> um, I, I, had, I, I bumped into the Basel Action Network's report, famous report, Exporting Harm. This would have been about 2003. Actually, I, have, I, I do have some supplemental slides that uh, show some of this. So, um, oh, there it is. Okay, so I'm in Malaysia doing field work on a new urban area that's getting built, all related to high tech. Walking through a village that's being um, more or less replaced by urban development. And what do I see outside of someone's door? This is 2002, right? same year the Basel Action Network report came out. I had no idea that that might be an important picture when I took it, but I was like, oh yeah, huh, 
there's some electronics that someone has kind of put out in a maybe garbagey sort of way. Oh yeah, didn't I read that report? I'll take a photo about it. This has nothing to do with my PhD research, but that could be important. Hold that thought. Well, here it is. Here's that thought. The thought being that, so even at, at this point, right, you see the, the so-called developing world, the non-annex seven, a non-annex seven state where discarded electronics is a normal part of, of certainly not everyone's lives, but you know, a good, a good portion of the population. This, this house is, you know, it's not um, abject poverty, it's, you know, I would say, a, you know, kind of a Malaysian middle class, lower middle class household. Um, and and there, you know, even this precious bit of equipment is just being more or less haphazardly tossed outside. I mean, anyone could have walked by to get it. Someone clearly didn't, wasn't too concerned about it disappearing. Or if they were, they didn't worry about that. So, yeah. So listening to you speak and listening to Max speak, um, it's inspirational in a lot of ways, but to an everyday person who does not necessarily want to be a research laboratory type scientist can be a little bit discouraging sure. um, because it's like recycling isn't making the difference that everyone's telling us that it's making. What can we actually do to help? Right. Yeah, so um, part of my response would be to find the, those things that you can, where your action, your agency, small though it may seem, scales. So getting behind things like fair repair legislation where that moves you know, from your individual action, which is really, you know, their, their major push was just getting signatures, right? not a huge effort on your individual part, but should it come to pass, the scale of that radically changes. Um, and I'll just zoom back to one of here. So, um, I, I, so, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so these are websites from Government of Canada, US, and UK three jurisdictions that have petition-based legislation um, possibilities, I guess. Each jurisdiction is different, but if you, get a certain, if you propose a, a piece of legislation or a topic of debate and get a sufficient number of signatures, the uh, Parliament in Canada, the Parliament in the UK, and Congress in the US are legally um, required to debate. They may not pass a law. But they are legally required. Okay. In in Canada, the threshold is shockingly small. You need as many as five signatures. <laughs> in the UK, it's a hundred thousand. I think it's also a hundred thousand in the US. Um, what, so, what, so what am I saying? Here? You know, generating an act, a, a kind of action-oriented or activist-oriented program around getting people to possibly get something debated is hard to make sexy, right? But it's those sorts of things that if they can get past the person who may take many rounds, will scale in ways that will actually change them. Uh, so a reason a lot of these products get broken in the first place is oftentimes, isn't there a, oftentimes a planned obsolescence on the part of these tech companies? Uh, so I'm just curious that these, um, these repair companies, they might even have a stake in this planned obsolescence, which oftentimes falls on the shoulders of the consumer. Uh, are there, is there anything being done on that like, side of things with planned obsolescence from these consumer goods? Yeah, you know, I think I'll, actually there's a fair 
bit of uh, stuff going on there. So the, the aftermarket repair sector, do they have a stake in planned obsolescence? Um, some do. Um, there, there's a, a vast ecology of repair behind the brands. So companies like Apple, not just Apple, but, but others as well, um, do have plans where when a, you know, if a consumer product breaks, they will, under certain conditions, take it back, get it repaired, and, and give it back to you. That depends on a, a vast system of repair subcontractors, which is largely invisible because the, the OEMs don't disclose who their repair people are. That part of things, I could see potentially having a vested interest. The independent repair sector, it's more difficult to see having vested interest in planned obsolescence because they're actually very concerned about how changes that are made by original equipment manufacturers um, <clears throat> actually harm their business. So the, the most recent flare-up of this, was, you may have heard the Error 53 so-called Error 53 controversy. It was, again, related to an Apple product. Um, but it was turning out that um, under certain circumstances, if you fiddled with the home button on an iPhone, as you would in a standard repair process, it would um, essentially turn, you know, brick the phone um, through what Apple claimed was a, a software glitch, and no one really understands if it was a deliberate thing or, or not. Planned obsolescence is, I mean, it is there, but I think, as I was saying to some of you earlier, um, it seems to me, without letting OEMs off the hook around planned obsolescence, often obsolescence is a secondary effect of other changes that are made for other reasons, reducing costs, increasing energy efficiency, what have you. Things that themselves may have certain ethical goods, right? A sense of good and right action, where you know increased energy efficiency is what you, you do want that, but one of the secondary consequences is that it, it miniaturizes components so much, for example, that it, if it doesn't become impossible to repair, it becomes all the more difficult to repair, yeah. With the ubiquity of this mind bomb of recycling, do you think in order for that to change, that would need to be more social or more like scientific and more academic? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's no single, there's no single solution to, to that. I mean, um, I, in some ways, uh, implicitly, I was you know, performing another mind bomb with this image, right, where, so this is a, oh, sorry, not this image. <laughs> um, this one that I, that I finished on. So this was a, a photo I took while I was in Bangladesh in a very small rural village outside of Dhaka. Um, you know, this is, I mean, rural, rural Bangladesh. <clears throat> and here, these kids had cell phones and were taking pictures of me, right? And this was 2009. That this, so the mind bomb here is to kind of fracture that still very persistent image I think we have of us, them, first world, third world, developed, developed. Of course there are there is difference or differences in the plural. Of course they're there. I'm not you know trying to suggest there isn't. But um, as as this suggests, right, there there is um, a very important um, swath of the world that is already deeply engaged with information technology as users, not just on the receiving end of waste, right? Um, and when, when we stick to the, what I would call the dominant storyline around e-waste, um, we start proposing solutions that are, they're either not going to achieve solutions even on their own terms, um, uh, and they, they are increasingly irrelevant to the current and, and likely future patterns of, of trade in discarded electronics. So if we're going to expend a lot of time and energy trying to come up with solutions, we really should work 
hard and think carefully about matching action to intended result. Yeah. So I think it needs it needs all of that. You know, um, all of that being social, economic, academic. Yeah. Can we have uh, one last question? There uh, seems to be a move away from lead-based solder in uh, assembling electronics. Uh, can you comment on uh, how that uh, would increase uh, energy consumption in the manufacturing and, and whether on balance that, uh, that really is, uh, is something that's uh, worthwhile, uh, worthwhile to be doing? Right. Yes, I can comment. I, I, don't, know, I don't know really anything all about how the switch uh, away from lead affects energy consumption. Um, what I do know is that uh, a large part of that switch results from regulation in Europe. Uh, the, um, ROHS, Re Reduction of Hazardous Substances Legislation, ROS or ROSE it's called, um, which has mandated out certain um, chemicals and materials that have toxic uh, characteristics. That's another, the ROS legislation is another thing I would point to as solutions that scale because you're affecting things before they're made in the first place. Um, and it's important that, that a, a market like Europe has done that because it's so big, it makes it, when it makes the switch like that, uh, original equipment manufacturers really, they're not going to have two different models, one for Europe, right, that is lead free, and one for the US, which is full of lead. They will, the European legislation becomes the default global regulation. Uh, so that, that is important related to, to, to lead in that lead was mandated out um, and the substitute was tin. Um, tin is less toxic when it comes to dismantling and recycling, <laughs> but tin is also mined. And it's mined in places like Indonesia uh, using, you know, huge open pit kinds of techniques like you saw at the Bisbee Copper Mine. So yes, you've you, you have, you've solved one toxicity issue, opened up another, and in my view, you know, there is no objective criteria to say that one is the better one. And I mean, this is what makes the real world interesting, right? Where the, the answers are totally unclear. That you can make an ethical argument about good and right action in sort of both directions, but um, so the, the the electronics without lead are less toxic, but for whom and under what conditions? Well, they're less toxic for the recyclers and potentially for you if it's somehow damaged in front of you. That's a good that's hard to be against. <laughs> but at the same time, achieving that good has meant that Indonesian miners, right, and ecologies in Indonesia are affected by that that switch uh, as well. So. Please, anyone, show me the great ledger by which we can tally up the goods and, and bads and come to an objective decision on that. I, I don't know where it is. Yeah. But again, this is why we need to care right, about our technologies in the, in the full sense of that word. Yeah. I see a burning desire over there. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, scaling up. Wouldn't the most effective way, or wouldn't a very effective way to be scale up is just not buy the new thing that comes out, just stick with your oldest one as long as you can possibly use it? <laughs> yes, ethical consumption, conscious consumption. <clears throat> um, Jevin's paradox. <clears throat> uh, the, more, the less you buy, the more that's on the market for someone else to buy, the more that's on the market, the cheaper it is for them to buy. You can, it's, it's a paradox, right? And it's not, but having said that, having pointed to things like the Jevons paradox, 
I don't want to suggest that that is an, a, you know, a, somehow a natural economic force, right? Those kinds of um, situations can be altered through legislation, regulation, right? I mean, um, uh, some of you, I'm sure, are aware of, I'm not even sure what to call it, but a, you know, a movement toward uh, degrowth where the idea is, you know, we can consciously reduce the size of economies in ways that deal with inequality uh, and don't, um, you know, necessarily mean um, radically uh, reducing um, various forms of quality of life, depending on what you mean by quality of life. So don't buy. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's not going to achieve things the way, in, in a very similar way that recycling doesn't uh, match to the, to the problem uh, being trying to be solved. So we could hang on to our iPhone 4s for a long time, but soon, a but then Apple puts out these other products that upgrade them, including new operating systems, and after a while that operating system will not run on your iPhone 4, and also there are many apps that won't, won't run on your iPhone 4. So no one's really conspiring to make this happen. It's just sort of, just sort of companies co-adapting to the strategies and presence of one another. Yeah. Well, no. Any ideas about how one gets out of this? Right. So there, there are some... There are some ways to, um, if not step outside, step in parallel to, so um, you may have an Apple branded laptop, you can run another operating system on it. Um, you know, there are, now, I say that like, and anyone can do that. Um, <laughs> you know, I know that things like Ubuntu are out there, Linux is out there. Um, it would be a major thing for me to shift over my, my electronic ecology of stuff that I rely on for my day-to-day -day work environment to those operating systems, but I could do it. Um, the, especially the Linux uh, um, system is, it's robust enough that there, you know, if I, if I need a word processor, a spreadsheet, uh, presentation software, and a few other basics, it'll, it'll run fine on, on an old, um, an old machine. So, um, but therein lies, you know, part of the problem is that that it is possible to do that, but it, it's not easy. Um, it, um, it's certainly not as easy as, oh, new operating system. I don't understand it. I'll just recycle it and get a new one, right? I mean, that's that's part of the paradox, right? Is that recycling becomes the easy option? The take back becomes the easy option. Um, Making making parallel you know operating systems more user friendly for for a larger chunk of us um, you know might be action that scales for example. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Josh. I'm sure many of us have questions and comments that we'd like to talk to you about, and you'll be here until uh, tomorrow afternoon. That's and right. so, yeah. Um, thank you again. Have Not at all. My pleasure. Thanks for being here.